We're studying foundation truth and we've come to lesson 34, which is on the subject of ministry gifts, ministry gifts. Very important study in the Bible and it's a continuation of the one that we did on church government. Our lesson text comes from the book of Ephesians 4 and 11, where it says, and he himself, speaking of Jesus Christ, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4 and 11. This, this describes the work of the ministry. Now, you may remember in a previous lesson we studied, God the Father gave us what's called motivational gifts, motivational gifts, and that came from Romans, the 12th chapter, verses six through eight. We also studied the manifestation gifts that are given to us by God the Holy Spirit. That comes from the study in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses eight through 10. In this particular lesson, we want to study the gifts that Jesus Christ, God the Son, gives to us. These we call ministry gifts. And I'm using as our text, Ephesians 4 and verse 11. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. These are ministry gifts that are given to the church. Now the government of the church is to be in the hands of the elders or the bishops of the church, the overseers of the church. The, the word elder we saw described the man. The word bishop describes the office. And the word pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, that describes the work that they do. That describes their work. And so that's what we're going to be studying in this particular lesson is the work of the fivefold ministry, the ministry gifts that God has given to the church. The uniqueness of these are they are individuals, both men and women, that God has given to the body of Christ, to the church, to minister to these different needs. Let's talk about them. The first one, what is an apostle? There is a lot of confusion over this word, particularly in our day and time, apostle. The word just simply means one that is sent forth with authority. They go as a representative, representing whoever the authority is. And that person gives them authority. In this case, we're talking about the authority of God. God has authorized them to go in their place. They, they are actually a spiritual father to other ministers. That describes them. Someone has asked me some time ago if, if uh, I missed uh, pastoring people. And I said, I never stopped pastoring. Now what I do, I pastor pastors. That's the work of an apostle. An apostle is a spiritual father to other ministers. Now there are several things that they do. Point A, under Ephesians 2 and 20, you find they lay foundational truths. They, they establish these foundational truths of restoring things to the church. They also establish new congregations, new assemblies. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Paul said, I may be I'm not an apostle to others, but doubtless I am to you because I am your spiritual father. I'm the one that founded this church. They are also humble and sacrificial. Now this is completely opposite of the way that the world looks at great leadership. They think of great leadership as those that lord it over other people. No, that's not true with the ministry gifts. It's not true of an apostle. In fact, Paul uses the word, he said, God has set us apostles last, last. We are servants to others. So you find these description in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, verses 22 and 23. Also in the 12th chapter, verses 12, 11 through 13. You find they are humble people. Anyone that is proud has disqualified themselves from the role of being an apostle. And then another one of the qualifications that only God can do in a minister's life 
is their ministry is accompanied by signs, wonders, and miracles. Things that only God can do for them. In 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter and verse 12, Paul is talking about his own spiritual qualifications of being an apostle. Now, these are things that, that people cannot do for you. You, you. you cannot vote in an apostle. Uh, no, because their authority doesn't come from people. It doesn't come from the congregation. The authority comes from God. God calls them and puts them in that position. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the ministry of an apostle. Let, let, let's go to the second one, the prophet. What is a prophet? Prophets are unique people. They are also involved in having spiritual authority. The, that laying spiritual foundations on the church is built on the foundation which the apostles and prophets laid, is what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. So a prophet is one that speaks forth an inspired message, a divine message, something that God has given to them. It's an inspired utterance. They, this is an office that these people are in. They, as I said, lay foundational truths. And we find that in Ephesians 2 and 20. They are along with the apostle in helping to lay these doctrinal truths. They give divine revelation. God reveals things to them. Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 3 through 5. God makes things known that nobody else could know. God reveals it to them. Sometimes, and this one because of the uniqueness of it, stands out to many people, but they foretell future events. That's not the main purpose that they have, but it is one of the things that God uses them is to speak about the future, something that is going to happen in the future. And a good example of that is in the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, verse 27 28, Agabus, a prophet, stood up and spoke about a famine that was going to come. That happened. And then another one of the things that identifies them, they exhort. The word means to build up, to encourage. They confirm and counsel the brethren. You find this in Acts, the 15th chapter and verse 32. The apostles and the prophets. The prophets built up and encouraged the people. It says of them, they were prophets, and so they inspired others with their utterances. Now, let's talk about the third one of these different ministry gifts. That is the ministry gift of an evangelist. What is an evangelist? The word simply means one that brings good news, a messenger of good news. That's what the gospel is all about. Now, the, the, the description of these, point A is, they have a special ministry to the lost and also to sick people. And the reason is because many people that are lost are sick. There is a lot of sickness in our world. So in Acts the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 8, you find where Philip the evangelist goes down to Samaria and he begins to bring them good news. He begins to bring healing to a lot of people. So this is usually one of the emphasis in the ministry of an evangelist. The point B, they have an emotional appeal. They are able to touch people's emotions. In other words, if they can make you laugh, they also can make you cry. They're able to touch your emotions. Acts the seventh chapter and verse 54. These are the type of people that are inspirational speakers. And then uh, they should be diligent in the word. And I take this from 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15, and also the fourth chapter, verses one through five. It, it's one of the things that I've seen that, it, particularly if there's a ministry to sick people, praying for sick people and sick people being healed and, and set free from their sicknesses, if we're not careful, that overrides the ministry of the word of God. That's a mistake because the evangelist is primarily a person that is bringing good news to the lost, to those that do not know Christ. And so they must be very diligent to keep the focus on reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And if they do that, 
they were fulfilling their ministry as an evangelist. Now let's, let's ask the fourth one. The fourth one, what is a pastor? What is a pastor? The word pastor simply means a shepherd, a feeder, one that feeds the flock. And so the, the shepherd is one that oversees a local congregation. He is a shepherd for a local church. In Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, verses 12 through 16, he talks of the qualifications, what a shepherd does, how that he heals, how he feeds, how he nurtures the sheep. He takes care of the flock. They are also able to discern false teachers. That's a very important gift for a shepherd to have is the gift of discerning of spirits. Revelation, the second chapter in verse two. And if you don't have that ability, then many times wolves will come among the flock and will create all kinds of havoc and, and pain in the local church because the shepherd was not alert, was not aware of what was going on. And they allowed these wolves to come in among the flock. So one of the things that a shepherd does is to protect the flock from those that would harm them. Point C, a good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. That's an excellent qualification. John the 10th chapter, verse 11 through 14, Jesus used himself as the example and he said, that's what good shepherds do. Good shepherds give themselves for the people. As someone said, they live and die with the people. They, they, they serve the flock. They realize how valuable the sheep are. And so they, they focus their ministry efforts on making sure the sheep are well provided for. They are cared for, that they are fed. And then finally, I will mention the condemnation of false pastors and shepherds. In Ezekiel, the 34th chapter in verse 1, and Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter in verse 1. Again, these prophets, they, they spoke terrible condemnation, the cursed that would come upon false shepherds, those that come in only serving themselves, feeding themselves, and not taking care of the flock of God. That, that is a terrible thing to do. And if you do that, you're going to find yourself in big trouble with God because the people belong to the Lord. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And then the fifth one, the fifth one is, what is a teacher? What is a teacher? A teacher is basically a master or a scholar. It's someone that God has given the ability to, to assimilate knowledge and to be able to share it in bite-sized portions where people can understand what the Word of God really means. It, it is sad, but many people are not able to discern the Scripture. They, they do not able what Paul called to rightly divide the Word of Truth. And that's what makes them so vulnerable to false prophets and false teachers that come in and they're, they're wolves among the sheep and they destroy the flock with false doctrine, false teaching. So a good teacher is able to take the truth and communicate it in ways that people can understand. Now, there's many different ways that you can do this. For instance, Jesus taught by miracles. He used miracles to teach the people the truths that he was trying to communicate to them. I remember the, the one illustration where Jesus healed the man that had been crippled. And they were complaining and saying, who can forgive sins? And he said, the same one that is going to say, take up your bed and walk. If I can say, get up and walk, then I also have a right to talk to you about your spiritual life. And so Jesus used signs and wonders and miracles to teach them. And Luke, the fifth chapter, verses one through 10 is a good example of that. The apostle Paul taught by reasoning. This was one of the main ways that Paul was able to communicate truth to us and how I thank God for the writings of Paul because Paul reveals so much spiritual truth to us 
Acts the 24th chapter and verse 25. You, you find Paul, and, and it was a great gift that God had given him in communication. The way to communicate truth in a way that you and I can understand it. And even to this day, we are preaching and teaching from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Thank God for that. And then point C, a good teacher will build upon the foundation that the apostles and prophets have laid. In order to establish the saints, to give them stability, to give them roots, to help build them up, to nurture them so that they can grow in Christ. It's one of the things that is lacking in, in many churches. Many churches are emotionally driven. And emotions make good servants, but terrible masters. They do not have a good foundation in the Word of God. And that's why studies like what we're doing right now with Foundation Truth is so important for people to be able to live the Christian life as God intended for it to be lived. So teaching is, is one of those important gifts in the church. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter and verse 10. Without proper teaching, you're not going to be able to live the Christian life as Jesus intended it to be lived. Now, let me give you another question. What does the hand represent with the minister gifts? How does it represent them? Well, it, it's, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful comparison of spiritual truths. God takes the natural to teach us about the spiritual. The Bible said the hand of the Lord was with them. So let me talk about the hand ministry. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 9 through 16, he's, he's defining these different five ministry gifts and what they do to the edification, to the building up of the church, edifying the saints to do the work of the ministry. Basically, there's three things that I want to emphasize here. Identification. The hand ministry, those that are spiritual leaders are... They should be able to identify what God is doing in the congregation. They identify them. Then they're able to impart. They use their hands to bless and to encourage. They not just lay hands on the sick and find them being healed and recovering, but they also impart spiritual gifts. And so that is a part of the hand ministry. And then confirmation. With their hands, they are able to point out and encourage a church to confirm things to that church of what God is doing and saying among them. And so looking at the hand individually, the five different members on the hand. First, you have the thumb. The thumb, this speaks of governing, the, the government of God, the authority of God is given there. If you look at the thumb, it is unique to all the other members. It's the most powerful member on the hand. This, this member can touch all of the other members of the hand. In other words, he can touch prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And what I find in studying the New Testament, every one of the apostles were used in another one of those gifts. Like Barnabas, he's called an apostle, but he was an apostle prophet. Then, then you look at uh, Paul. Paul was an apostle teacher. Each one of them. Peter is an apostle pastor. And so that is the gift of the apostle to the body of Christ. Then the first finger. This is what we call the pointer finger or guidance. Giving direction to the church. It's the pointer. This talks about the prophet. The prophet gives guidance and direction. God gives inspired utterances to them to be able to direct the church. And then the, the second finger, the next finger is the longest finger on the hand. It reaches farther than all of the other fingers. It speaks about the evangelist. Because the evangelist is always traveling. It's itinerant ministry, going here, going there, encouraging people to follow Christ, encouraging people to dedicate their lives to Jesus Christ. That's the ministry of the evangelist, traveling farther than anybody else, 
because they are continually in itinerant ministry. Then we have the third finger. The third finger on the hand is called the love finger. And the reason it is called this is because it has the softest touch on the hand. It relates to the pastor, the pastor. Uh, th those that are taught in school how to apply facial makeup. It's with this third finger that they teach to touch the skin. Why? It has the softest touch. It does not break down the cells in the body. That is talking about the pastor, the pastor feels what the people feel. He has that kind of compassion. He's easily touched because uh, he is such a generous heart, a big heart, a big spirit. Then we have the fourth finger. The last finger on the hand is the teacher. This is for grounding the church. It's, it's bringing the word of God so that the church can be established in the word of God. Now, a unique feature of this, this little finger is the little finger is attached in the hand to the third finger. They only have one ligament. All the other hands have their own ligament that ties to the muscles that enables them to move, to flex, and to do their work, their ministry. But when you come to these last two, there's only one ligament in the hand, it's tied together here, and it branches out to these two fingers. It's one of the reasons why musicians are taught when they're playing music, uh, music, they can use the different fingers in different ways, with the exception of the last two. The last two should always be doing something in harmony together. And this is what I see concerning the church that if pastors are not teachers, for instance, if they have a gift of evangelism or prophecy, if, if that is a strong gift in their life, they need to bring teachers into their eldership. Teachers that are able to ground the church in the word of God, that are able to teach them so they can grow to maturity. And where I've seen pastors that do not have the gift of evangelism, they're able to, or excuse me, the gift of, of teaching. They're able to bring people to Christ, but they're not able to bring them to maturity. We need to work together with pastoring and teaching. And I think it's one of the reasons he said, and some pastors and teachers. Now, how do the five natural senses reveal these ministry gifts to us? There are five senses to the body. First, the ear, the ear. This is symbolic of the apostle. What it does, the ear provides hearing to the body, but not only hearing, it also provides balance to the body. That's right, in what's called your inner ear. In the inner ear, there is these little compartments and fluid in these sacs that they can tell you whether you're lying down, whether you're standing up. I mean, you don't have to open your eyes. You can tell that with your eyes closed because of the inner ear. And if the inner ear is causing problem, then the body loses its balance, what they call vertigo, and you just begin spinning and get dizzy and, and fall. I think it's one of the mistakes that we see that's made in the church because we do not recognize apostolic leadership as we ought to. We do not have the balance that we need in the body. Then we have not only the ear, but the eye, the eye. This is symbolic of the prophet. In fact, in the Old Testament, one of the earliest descriptions of prophets were, they called them seers, seers, because they saw things in the spirit world. They saw things that nobody else could see. They were seers. Now, what this does for the body, it produces vision, of course. Vision, we're not able to see what God wants us to see without this prophetic gift. But it also brings light and revelation to the church. And so through the church, the prophetic ministry is very important to give us vision. Then we have the nose. The nose. The nose does basically two things. Smelling. Smelling, and that, that's very important. They smell not only 
lovely fragrances, like I give you the picture here of a flower, the beautiful fragrances, but they also can smell the garbage. They can smell bad odors as well. That's part of the ministry of the gift of an evangelist. But also they bring like a breath of fresh air to the church. They, 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 they help the body to breathe. And even though the evangelist is preaching from the same body about the same Jesus and bringing the same spiritual message that the pastor has been teaching, they are able to do it like a breath of fresh air to the congregation. And then we have the hand or the ability to feel, to touch. This is the, the ministry of the pastor brings feeling to the body so that you're able to, to feel both pain and pleasure. Yes, both of those are important. They, they are important messages to the body. And the pastor does this so well. So the ability for touch, for feeling, is identified with the pastor. And then finally, we have the natural sense of tasting, tasting. This relates, of course, to digestion. This is the ministry of the teacher that he is able to take and she is able to take spiritual truth and to break it down so the body can ingest it and then digest it. You're able to swallow the truth and then put it into practice within your life. All of these are important. All of these. Without the apostle, you don't have hearing. Without the prophet, you don't have vision. Without the evangelist, there's not a breath of fresh air and smelling the fragrance of God. Without the pastor, you lose the feeling that we should have in the body of Christ. And without the teacher, we cannot properly digest our spiritual meals. So they're all important. These are the ministry gifts that God has given to the church so that the church can be edified and be everything God intended for it to be.